The story of Attila the Hun is a wholesome tale of happiness and warmth. This peaceful adventure of brotherly love, marriage, and a visit with the Pope is perfect for answering the question, is it possible to win the Attila the Hun campaign without killing enemy units? As the last of our heroes from the original Age of Empires 2 campaigns, Attila will face challenges both subtle and gross. How will he become King of the Huns if he cannot kill his brother Bleda? How will he defeat a seemingly endless army of Roman centurions and legionaries when he can't dirty his hands with their blood? How will he overcome the deathmatch battle of the Catalonian fields where his adversaries begin with scores of resources? And how will he advance finally through Italy to Rome itself while destroying five enemy wonders, all without killing even a single enemy unit? The peaceful Attila has his work cut out for him, so without further ado, let's get down to business and become King of the Huns. A severed head on a pike seemed such a grisly trophy to be displayed in the chapel at Chalon. This scenario opens with Bleda the Hun challenging his brother Attila to a hunt for the Iron Boar, staking the kingship of the Huns as their prize. Very well. The Iron Boar lairs near here. Let the one who kills this mighty beast lead our people. Hmm. Look at all those footprints in the snow heading into the forest. Those definitely are just Ensemble Studios showing off the new snow terrain in the Conqueror's expansion, and certainly not a sign of an ambush or anything. Bleda is a pacifist, and his plan is for the boar to kill Attila so he himself doesn't get counted for the kill. Tracks, brother. See if you can ride ahead and flush the boar out. We could turn his plan against him and let the iron boar finish him off. Bleda is no more. When Attila returns to camp, he alone will rule the Huns. But remember those footprints we saw earlier? Turns out they were pretty sus and there have been some imposter archers hiding in the woods all along. Attila murdered Bleda. We were too late to stop the bloodshed. We are left with an honorless cur for a leader. Now what were you doing in the forest, noble archer, if not waiting to ambush Attila at Bleda's command? Now best rid of Bleda. Hail Attila! They come back and start a bloody fight in the Hun camp. It's Tarkin versus Tarkin, Hun against Hun. No. We can't let this death and destruction happen, not an hour watch. We'll need an even more cunning plan. This scenario has three intended paths. Either we kill the boar and get ambushed by Vleda and his archers, kill Vleda and return to the Hun camp, or run away and flee across the river, where we build up a base and eventually return to defeat Vleda. It's a choice to hunt or be hunted, and we're going with the latter. Immediately, we start running away, and some of the Tarkins decide to follow us. Attila, coward! Fight and earn your right to rule! We head to take out a Roman watchtower at the nearby bridge, and eventually, Bleda comes and casts us out of his village of pacifists. Get out of my sight, Attila, and take your traitors with you. I have no brother! He turns around to head back to his town center, but we can loop around and attack him to get him to follow us again. When we head across the bridge, there are some triggers set up to give us villagers, resources, and control over the nearby buildings. But since Bleda is now following us across the river, this trigger converts him and all of his Tarkins as well. And at this point, we have completely broken the scenario. Bleda's old base doesn't train any more units, so they aren't a problem for us. Our objectives now change to defeating two of the three remaining opponents, but their AI scripts do not attack us until they detect the event that Bleda has been killed. Now there's only one problem with this plan, and that is, after the anniversary update, this scenario has been updated, so the trigger now only converts the buildings and not the units. That's okay though, because we could just play the scenario without having Bleda chase us across the river. All we have to do now is defeat two of the three opponents, and in the Definitive Edition, you don't actually have to kill Bleda, it's sufficient just to defeat your enemies in order to win. But, just because it will be a bit more fun to keep Bleda alive, I do have this save game file that I happened to save while testing before the anniversary update, so we will play with that and keep Bleda alive. I ain't gonna let those scenario designers stop me this time. 
the Persians are the strongest of our opponents, so we'll concentrate instead upon the Romans and the Scythians. We could use some more villagers as we build up, so let's head to the Roman camp. Some time ago, the Romans captured a number of Han villages. Bleda arranged for their return, but I did not trust Bleda, and I do not trust the Romans. We should free them. No bargaining! Hey, wait a minute. Bleda did arrange to free them, and we have Bleda. Our arrangement was with Bleda. I will not turn the captains over to Attila. You must take them by force. But Bleda's right here. Uh, the Romans don't start with any units, but they do start trading them once we enter their base. We head straight for their market and their monastery, as the AI is scripted to resign once these buildings are destroyed. We make short work of them and say goodbye to our first opponent. We rescue the villagers and meet another Roman prisoner. Wait! I am the son of Lypoxis, a leader amongst my people. If you will free me, you will be rewarded. Oh, um, we'll just let the Scythians know you're here. We won't go and uh, defeat them or anything. Yeah, just uh, stay there and oh, we'll send Dave to help you out on his way back from picking up his wife from the mall. Bye. Now we just boom up and start training some monks and Tarkins. Attila must survive and it's best that Pleather survives too so that the enemies don't start attacking us. What can we do to keep them safe? Well, the two of them, along with their horses, can garrison inside of a battering ram. Now, the Scythians don't rebuild their castle or their towers. They're supposed to rebuild their TC, but they don't collect stone, so they'll never have the resources to do so. We can train up some Tarkins and snipe down these key buildings. Tarkins have extra pierce armor and an attack bonus against buildings, so they're quite useful for conducting a pacifist siege. At this point, the only units the Scythians train are 17 cavalry archers. Slowly but surely, we convert the rest of their army with our monks until they have only CA left. Then we snipe down their archery rangers, convert their CA, and spread out our Tarkins to prevent their villagers from rebuilding these production facilities. Finally, we convert the remaining Scythian villagers until they have few enough left that they resign. Attila has done such a great job of being a pacifist that he even kept his brother alive. So far, the brother kings of Attila and Bleda are much better pacifists than were kings Alfonso and Sancho. This scenario has the greatest number of triggers of all of the original campaigns, so it's nice that we found a way to work around them. And after being inspired by our Tarkins, the Romans decide they want better to understand our ways of pacifism, so they send a young boy to live with us. The name of this boy was Flavius Aetius, a name not soon to be forgotten. I'm sure he'll go on to become a wonderful pacifist, just like Attila. In the next scenario, we continue bringing the ways of pacifism to the Eastern Roman Empire. The Romans have a fortress in the eastern corner of the map, and we need to destroy its town center in order to win. There are various outlying cities that we can attack in order to gain the units and supplies we require to lay our siege. First, we ride to Sophia, where we can head straight to their town center with our Tarkins. With their bonus damage against buildings, they make short work of the TC and capture the food stored inside of it. The Sophians had much food stockpiled in their town center. Next, we head to Nysus, where we raise a watchtower and a few lumber camps in order to get some wood. We have captured all of Nysus's lumber. Now we head south, skirting around the Roman fort and come to Adrianople. We use our cavalrys to distract the monks while our Turkins destroy the mining camps. Leaving units on no attack stance means they just stand still and don't retaliate after being converted. Roman gold. There is no other metal that shines as sweetly. And next, most importantly, we head to Thessalonica. Our Turkins have a good amount of pierce armor, so we don't have to worry about the archers shooting at us. Instead, we destroy their houses and capture their villagers. Now these peasants will do our bidding. Let us find a suitable location to establish our camp. Now that we have some villagers and resources, it's time to run away and find a safe place to build up. We're not going to build a town center, however. The Romans are supposed to leave their fort to attack us after 40 minutes, but their gates are locked at the start of the scenario to prevent them from killing our horde while we're still in the initial phases of raiding. And the trigger to unlock these gates fires only when we construct a town center. So long as we don't build a TC, we will never be attacked. 
As our villagers go to work, we can add in some monks and continue converting the remaining enemy villagers. The villagers don't know what to do without sites to deposit their resources, so they're easy conversions for our monks. Hunnic monks receive the atonement technology, allowing them to convert other monks, so we can pacify the monks in Adrianople as well. And finally, we convert the army of Dyrachium and defeat them by destroying their town center. Now that we have defeated Dyrachium, we can easily free the prisoners. There's only one thing left to do before attacking the Romans. I do not like the looks of this. We send six villagers to join the Scythian wild women. One quick look at their camp tells us that they are most definitely pacifists who will take good care of our villagers. Or at least, they'll treat them better than we will. We can add in some more Tarkins for sniping the Roman TC. To lure their army out of their base, we finally construct a TC of our own. As they leave, we blast open their gate with a few petards. And having made Snippy proud, we run in and raise their town center. Hans of Ransak our fort! I fear for the future of the Empire! Another scenario down, as Attila is doing a great job of showing the Romans the correct way to follow a set of pacifist beliefs. The riverbanks were covered with human bones, and the stench of death was so great that no one could enter the city. The Eastern Roman Empire, so inspired by our peaceful ways, has started paying us to continue teaching our beliefs throughout their lands. We find ourselves outside the walls of Constantinople. Their AI never attacks us, but we do need to worry about Marcianopolis and Philippopolis. We do have a solution, though, as both of these players resign as soon as their town centers are destroyed. And even more, they are so thankful that we stop them from training non-pacifist soldiers that destroying their TCs even encourages them to pay tribute to us. We begin the scenario by heading southwest to build a siege workshop near the unwalled Philippopolis. We also use our monk to convert their two trade carts. The merchants pay us gold after our holy man will lose them over to the peaceful traditions of the Huns. The Huns are disrupting our trade routes. Take this gold and be gone. Red has only archers, so they won't be in much trouble for our Tarkins and Rams. We take out their town center, and they resign. The Republic has lost its town center. Why won't these Huns just leave? We then proceed to extract even more tribute from them. Attila, king of the Huns, if we give you 500 more gold, will you cease these raids? That's the red player dealt with, but while that's going on, we also have to deal with Marcianopolis. We train a few scouts to distract their army, while we send a villager to the east to construct a dock. We research the war galley and bodkin arrow upgrades for their extra range, then train a single war galley. Marcianopolis trains neither combat ships nor ranged land units. This one war galley can sit back and leisurely destroy both of their docks. While that's going on, let's turn our attention to Constantinople. They have a beautiful wonder at the center of their city and they would absolutely love for us to turn it into a monument to pacifism. We'll have to visit, so let's load up onto a transport ship. They are so enthusiastic about our visit that they send a fire ship to open the sea gate for us. We land and head inside to their wonder. No! You must not destroy our wonder, the cornerstone of our city! Take this, please, and leave! Now, after a good while has passed, our war galley finally manages to take out both of Green's docks. You have destroyed our shipyards. We will pay you 500 gold to cease these attacks. Finally, this galley takes out their town center. The Huns have torched Marcianopolis. Please take these 3,000 gold and just go away. But our one galley is not done yet, as we now sail it all the way around the outside of the map being careful to avoid Constantinople and all of their fire ships until we again reach Philippopolis. They have one dock remaining, and even though they're defeated, we'll still get gold from destroying it. We'll just wait around for our galley to finish it off, and then we win the scenario. Now the Huns are attacking the docks at Philippopolis. Can nothing be done about them? The Romans have given us the gold we need. Now we can truly establish a Hunnic Empire. One war galley, 10,000 gold, and zero kills.
Having brought peace to the Eastern Roman Empire, Attila continues his journey towards the Western Empire, planning to teach them about pacifism by marrying the Emperor's sister. There are three opponents we'll need to take care of on our way, and then we'll need to convince the Western Roman army to lay down its arms and spread love instead of war. The first of our opponents are the Burgundians. Once we destroy their town center, they'll beg for mercy and ask to be our allies. They don't have any military units or production facilities at the start of this scenario, so we can move in and take them out right away. And by right away, I mean right away. We have lots of starting resources for town centers, so we chop down some straggler trees and break one of the sacred rules of Nomad by placing a TC in prime position to shoot down the Burgundian's TC. We have to make sure that Robo isn't watching, otherwise the AI could ask for an admin re. Anyway, the AI doesn't garrison and fire back at our foundation, and even though their TC fights back once we shoot at it, the Burgundian villagers aren't smart enough to repair their TC or try to win the TC fight. Once their town center goes down, they ask to be our allies. Please spare us of great hands. We would join you if you could only tribute to us 500 gold and then build a castle in our town to help defend us. We send them some gold and then defend with monks while constructing a castle in the middle of their base. Hopefully we are not making a mistake, but for now, we ride with the Huns. Oh, you silly Burgundians. Of course you can trust us. We would never betray our allies. With our help, I'm sure you'll grow up to be your own civilization one day. Burgundy does respond if we send Taunt 31, but their response isn't much to write home about. And that's just fine, because the Huns don't have homes to write to anyway. Next, we use a combination of monks and jebate tactics to deal with the armies of Red and Cyan. Both of these players resign when they have no TC and few enough villagers. There's lots of gold in our corner of the map, so we can mine it to save up for the Huns' unique technology, Atheism. This incredibly useful technology cuts the cost of spies in half. We can use it cheaply to obtain line of sight of all of the Frankish units, as they don't have very many villagers to begin with. Now, we launch an assault against Red, destroying their production facilities and TC, then moving in to convert their villagers. It's not long before they resign. Next, we do the same to Cyan. They do manage to put up some more resistance, and they do train an Imperial Age army, but eventually, they too succumb to non-violence, as have so many peoples before them. But when their town center goes down, we face the ultimate challenge. A large army of legionaries and centurions is marching our way. With desperation in their eyes and violence in their hearts, they aim to end the sufferings of peace we inflict upon their allies. What can monks do against such reckless hate? Block them, of course. All we have to do is stand a couple of units on the ice over here, then the Roman army cannot spawn, and after a short wait, they are defeated. Now we just hunt down the final villagers from Cyan and win the scenario. We cannot kill that which doesn't exist, and by stopping the Roman army before it appears, we complete the scenario with zero kills. We can look back proudly at how peacefully we moved throughout Gaul, bringing Attila closer to his fiance. People were tortured, their bodies torn asunder by wild horses, or their bones crushed under the weight of rolling wagons. With the defeat of his army, the Western Roman Emperor is quite pleased with Attila, he can, of course, allow only the purest of pacifists to take his sister's hand in marriage, and yet, this test still is not enough. Why, even the greatest of heroes might be forced to take a life under the most extreme of circumstances, how could Attila be any different? And for the next trial, the Emperor turns to someone who knows the Huns well, Flavius Aetius. As a young boy, he was sent to live with the Huns where he spent his time spectating their games and learning all about their pacifist ways. Now, he's concocted the ultimate plan to test Attila, a game of deathmatch. Aetius and his Roman forces start with 20,000 food, wood, and gold, and create cataphracts out of three castles in the map's northern corner. The Alans, 
Occupying the western corner, play as the Huns and train nimble cavalry archers, perfect for sniping down monks. And the Visigoths, making their camp in the map's southern reaches, are preparing to perfuse their infantry upon the Huns. Attila does have an ally, but, well, they're an AoE2 campaign ally. We need to stop our opponents before they can begin their unit spam. Of our three starting villagers, we task one to build a town center, and send the remaining two towards the Alans and the Goths. These villagers are responsible for channeling the powers of Lord Doubt into forward monasteries. Using a few horsemen, we can grab the attention of the enemy soldiers and lure them away from their bases. Once these guards are out of the way, our cavalry can swoop in and raid the enemy villagers. The AI isn't very intelligent. As it attempts to construct buildings, it does so using only one villager at a time. And if we attack this villager, without killing it of course, the AI will delete the building foundation, then go to rebuild it elsewhere. This process buys us time. Time to marshal our clergy of monks. Once our holy men start to mass in their numbers, we can begin to convert villagers in earnest. The opponents resign when they have few enough villagers, regardless of whatever military or buildings they have remaining. We add in a few battering rams to finish off the town centers, and end the production of those pesky villagers. Now, we have only the Romans to contend with, but they are the most dangerous of our opponents. We have some time before they begin their assault, and we use it to boom up. We have a population limit of 150, and we race to fill it as fast as we can. Spreading TCs throughout the map, we continue adding in villagers in preparation for the impending assault. As we build a castle, we research the Marauder's technology to train Tarkins from our stables, then do Atheism and Spies to gain vision of the Roman army. And just in time, as if we turn our eyes to the clock, we see the countdown to the Roman assault is just about to end. We must bestow ourselves with speed, as they are bravely in their battle set, and will with all expedience march upon us. Repeatedly, we charge and wave our torches against their stone structures, eventually burning them to the ground. Slowly but surely, we overwhelm the remaining Romans, pacifying them until they succumb to the peace imposed by our overwhelming numbers. The Roman army lies scattered. Now there is nothing to stop our invasion of Italy. And there we go. Zero kills at the Battle of the Catalonian Fields. Perhaps 300,000 men were left dead on the Catalonian fields. All of those kills belong to our opponents. Not a single one was ours. At last, Attila has reached Italy. The Romans have seen every one of their attempts to stop him end in a disastrous display of peace. There's only one thing left they can try, and that's defeating the Huns by channeling the power of pacifism themselves. That's right. They're going for a wonder victory, and just to be safe, instead of constructing one wonder, they're constructing five. First up is Patavium, who starts construction of a wonder 45 seconds into the game. When we approach their walls, Aquileia adds in their own wonder. Then, 30 minutes into the game, Mediolanum adds in a third wonder, and as we approach them, Verona begins yet another wonder. Finally. Patavium has a second town center hidden behind Verona's walls, and as we approach, they sneak back to their original city to construct one final wonder. Attila, guided by the pacifist knowledge of his brother Bleda, has but one chance to overcome the cunning Roman scheme. After an AI loses their wonder, they'll resign as soon as their town center is destroyed. If we manage to knock down these wonders, we can avoid fighting the enemy armies and force them to delete their units. We'll need plenty of trebuchets to destroy the Roman wonders, so we build a castle and as many walls as we can construct in a short time. We need these walls to stop enemy scouts from walking into our castle fire. Our first target is Patavium. We distract their soldiers, then set up a treb to snipe down their wonder. Its foundation suffers but a few shots before falling to the earth. With haste, our scene flies to Aquileia, 
where we use our Tarkins to draw out their armies. Rushing our trebs to their walls, they unpack and hurl their projectiles into the city. The wonder goes down, as does their town center, and their will to fight. Soon after, they resign. The city of Aquileia, at the tip of the Adriatic, was wiped off the face of the earth. Back on the home front, we continue adding in trebuchets, but we have a problem. The city of Mediolanum is marching its army towards our base. We can't snipe down their wonder until they begin constructing it, and they don't do so until 30 minutes have elapsed. We continue adding in trebuchets, and our brave Tarkins run out to distract the enemy patrols. But we can only hold out for so long. We sneak out of the sides of our base, but the damage is being done. Our castle must be deleted, and our villagers must be sacrificed. We do everything we can to buy time, but their army just continues pushing further and further. Our forces are desperate, our defenses are beaten, and our hopes are fading. Only after we've lost almost everything does Mediolanum decide finally to build their wonder. Could it be too late for us to assault? Does Attila's campaign end here? No, we're not done yet. Hidden upon the Terranian Sea, we've snuck a transport ship filled with trebuchets. Avoiding enemy fire ships, we head ashore, rushing our trebuchets to Mediolanum's walls. They unpack outside the city, fire, and destroy the Wonder and TC. But our victory is not yet at hand, as at the same time, we assault Verona from the Caspian Sea. Green may be resigning, but the champions continue chasing our trebs. With the few cav arches we have remaining, we lure their armies away and begin firing over Verona's walls. Their paladins charge outside to meet us, and our siege engines must get their shots off just in time to destroy their TC, Batavium's TC, and their wonder. Now we have but one opponent remaining to dispatch. Our trebuchets loop around from Mediolanum and move in from the east. Batavium has two castles for defense, but our trebs have enough pierce armor to withstand their fire. They release their projectiles, and down goes all before them. All that remains is Batavium's initial town center. We save some of our trebuchets on a transport ship, then loop around for one final display of pacifism. The defenders rush out, taking down the trebs, but not before we release one final shot. King Attila, before we pursue this wanton bloodshed any further, we request that you come personally to a meeting with Pope Leo I in Rome. And with that, Batavium begins deleting the rest of their units. Their corpses line the streets in celebration of our victory. The Pope asks for a meeting, and Attila obliges, looking forward to explaining the benefits of refusing to kill enemy units. As Attila ends his campaign, let's take a moment to reflect back on this journey. We've now completed every campaign from the Age of Kings and the Conqueror's expansion. In total, we have 11 kills by William Wallace, 1 or 5 by Genghis Khan, and 2 by El Cid. That's a total of 14 or 18 kills, depending on your trolley problem solution, as the minimum number required to win every scenario. Frankly, that's a lot better than I ever would have expected. As a kid, I don't think I ever actually won any of these scenarios without using cheat codes. Now, I've done almost all of them with zero kills, and honestly, I still don't understand how it was possible. Back when I first started these pacifist runs, I had about 1,500 subscribers. Now, we've grown to over 10 times that number and have over 15,000. My first Joan of Arc video has gotten close to 200,000 views, and the comment sections have been filled with lovely people whom I'm happy to see enjoy watching these videos. I'm not quite sure why the YouTube algorithm loves them so much, but I've certainly enjoyed making them, so I won't question it. I don't yet know what's coming next, but there are some new campaigns being released along with the new expansion, and perhaps we'll find out whether or not those campaigns can be won without killing enemy units as well. I've also been streaming on my Twitch channel, so please stop by and say hi sometime. Anyway, it looks like Attila is just about to finish his journey, 
So let's check in with the Pope. Attila, might I have a word with you in private, please? And there we have it. The final campaign, completed with zero kills. Thank you all very much for watching. Extra thanks to everyone who is supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time. Father Armand was silent for a long time. He glanced over at the head on a stake. A Hunnic trophy, he said. I think the man was a Visigoth. He died at the Battle of the Catalonian Fields. I keep it here so that I may see it every day and remember. Remember what, Father? I asked him. The scent of a burning village. The sound of butchery. The way peasants would flee before the Hun riders. The way we would ride them down. The way it felt to conquer alongside Attila and the Huns. He leaned so close, I could feel his breath. Sometimes, I miss it.